This ticker podcast is brought to you by Broadridge Financial Solutions. Hi, everyone. Millennials, that is to say, roughly, adults under 40, aren't big stock market investors. One reason? They've got no money. In fact, it's a generation that's deep in the red. But even if they had money, they still might not give it to Wall Street. That's because they don't trust the market. They've seen how bankers can lie, how dot-coms can bust, and how Enrons can, well, lie and bust. Experts on the ephemerality of financial and physical assets, they are said to seek instead experiences. My guest today is an expert on delivering experiences, specifically digital experiences. What people want is contextually relevant experiences for them. And in particular, millennials, they want information that recognizes who they are, speaks the language that they want to receive, and the information, the presentation, the experience is relevant to what they care about. Rob Krugman is Chief Digital Officer at Broadridge. He spent years studying that language, applying user-centered design practices to decode the millennial mindset and helping his clients take up the communications technologies and practices that have a chance at engaging millennials and rebuilding a bond of trust. That's up right after this week's Ticker News Update. Donald Trump may be the most politically divisive president in history, but an IR magazine survey finds that, overall, U.S. investors and analysts think he's been good for stock markets. So far, 60% of poll participants give him a thumbs up. But you get a more divided opinion when asked whether they expect Trump's policies to continue to be positive for markets. Just 46% think they'll be good, with a substantial share, 43%, saying time would tell. Uber's much-discussed IPO is already oversubscribed. Bloomberg says Uber has met potential investors in London and New York and will also visit Boston and San Francisco. The IPO values the company at almost $84 billion. More and more institutional investors are turning to digital assets. Research by Fidelity Investments shows almost a quarter of institutions already have some exposure to digital assets such as Bitcoin, while 4 in 10 say they're open to future investments. And finally, NERI IRC credential holders can now earn professional development units when they attend IR Magazine educational events. Digital editor Ben Ashwell caught up with NERI president Gary LeBranch at last month's IR Magazine Awards US. PDU credits are important for the 160 so or so people that have already uh, received the IRC designation. Every three years they have to requalify by showing that they have uh, done continuing professional education. So IR Magazine will help us in that effort. And every single year we do at least two to three exams and add another 20 to 30 people every single time. So, you know, it takes, uh, takes a couple of generations to build this certification, but uh, it is the leading edge for the profession into the future. Upcoming events in which PDUs can be earned include this fall's IR Magazine West Coast Think Tank in Palo Alto and the IR Magazine Global Forum in Amsterdam. According to a study published by Broadridge and the Center for Generational Kinetics, while retiring baby boomers showed a conventional preference for U.S. equity investments, two-thirds of millennials opted for low-interest savings accounts over every other investment. Now, I collect a government old age pension, and I plan on being an economic burden to the system for many decades to come. These millennials are about to inherit a whole bunch of money. If they don't buy your story and invest in public markets, me and the rest of my generation are screwed. I know, right? 
So listen up, IROs. Seriously. You know, for our clients, and when you develop experiences, you develop solutions, and you develop new products, you know, one of the questions I think a lot of people have, given the huge wealth turnover that's happening, is how do I create products and services that more effectively enable me to engage and communicate with millennials? And what's interesting about it is if you do a bunch of analysis and you look at it, while there's definitely some very specific things about millennials, in many ways, they also act like other folks, right? So age is not the only demographic that we can look at when we actually segment people, because you can find a 25 or a 30-year-old that acts very similarly to a 70-year-old, you can also find a 70-year-old that acts very similarly to a 25 or 30-year-old. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's really understanding your customers. And then, you know, the way I often look at it is if you go back 10 years ago, we were creating products and services and communications based upon profiles, right? If we were an organization and we wanted to communicate out with our customers, you know, we would break them into... 10 distinct profiles. And, you know, there's different profiles that were always out there, right? There were profiles like soccer moms and there were profiles, Mm -hmm. high net worth investors. There were, you know, all these different profiles that we came up. Um, I think what's happened over the last 10 years, five years has been that there's so much more data now available to us that we could recognize that, you know, there's probably not 10 profiles. There actually may be, you know, half a million profiles when I'm communicating with, you know, 10 million people, right? In Mm -hmm. that, you know, there's, there's a lot more personalization that's required and uh, responsive-based design. And when I talk about responsive, I'm not talking about the way it shows up on a mobile device or on a computer, though that's important. What I'm talking about is that what people want is contextually relevant experiences for them. And in particular, millennials, they're not interested in just generic information. They want information that recognizes who they are, speaks the language that they want to receive. Um, and by language, I'm using that as a, you know, not Spanish or English, I'm, I mean more, though that's important too. <laughs> um, what, what I mean by that is that it's the information, the presentation, the experience is relevant to what they care about. And when that's done properly, the response rates, the engagement rates, the action that people take, and the brand awareness grows significantly. Um, experience becomes a big driver here. Tailor-made for their circumstance. Exactly right. And, 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 and other people are going through the same circumstances, so it becomes helpful. But if, you know, an example would be, you know, you communicate out to someone something, and if we send the exact same thing to everyone, it's very generic. But if I recognize that the person I'm communicating with right now is maybe going through a process where they're looking to buy their first home, maybe I can include some research about buying your first home that's relevant to them. And that's just an example. I think when it comes to investing, it becomes around recognize the life stages that they're at, Make sure that the conversation is built around those stories and understand who you're talking to and the way that they think and what's important to them. And I think if you, if you build your products and you build your talk track and you build how you converse with that individual based upon that information, you're going to be a lot more effective. Okay. How do you, how do you begin that conversation with them? What is on their mind? And, uh, and Rob, uh, how old are you? I, I am not. I'm a, I am a, <laughs> I'm Gen X, so I am uh, 48 years old, okay. so a little bit ahead. <laughs> um, so not, you know, not financial, uh, no, I'm sorry, not um, a digital native. I'm kind of a little bit behind that. My kids are digital natives. So, you know, I, I think when, there's a few things you have to kind of go in and understand. And one of the most important things I think from the investment space is millennials are interested in advice from people they feel that they can trust. Right? And if you think about how that ties into, they're a, a group that's been brought up around social. And sometimes it's shocking if you look at how much information gets shared socially, right? You're like, oh, I don't know if I would share that information, but they do. And that's the way decision making happens is they look for trusted advisors and trusted people to be able to be part of that group and part of that organization. And so I think one of the ways when we try to sell investment products and we try to get people to invest with us is to hit on the, you know, the, the value that we can bring, and right, whether it's a financial advisor who's speaking not in a generic form but speaking about the specific needs of people based upon their age and their demographic and start to ask questions that allow them to cover more information 
and use that to not just you know, qualify who they're talking to, but basically change the talk track as they're going through it. But you know, for organizations then, and they're trying to actually communicate with these folks, think about how they get information, right? So one of the ways they get information is through a dialogue. We may be having an in-person dialogue. What's the thing that they're probably going to do afterwards? They're probably going to go out and they're going to do some, they're going to Google and they're going to look up your company and they're going to look for information on it. And what people think about you as an organization becomes really important. They're going to read reviews. They're probably going to go right to the negative reviews and see what people said and how you responded to what people said, right? That's kind of like the first thing they're going to do. Then they may go on to social media. And they may start asking a larger group of people what they think about you and what they think about these services and why should I invest in this company, which may, for some millennials, will definitely drive them towards more activist type things where they may actually look at environmental, sustainability, governance type characteristics that maybe generations before may not be as a focus for them. For millennials, they are. And they're going to look at that type of information when they make their decisions. So I... You know, there's a term that's used on the marketing side often, um, the term net promoter score, NPS, okay. net promoter. And the idea is that you want your customers to be promoters of your brand, right? And you can apply that in so many different areas, right? If I am a public company, I want my investors to be promoters of me as an organization because they'll speak highly about it. Maybe other people will want to invest. And I think as it comes to millennials, that NPS becomes really important because they're working with a group of trusted advisors that hopefully you can be part of, but it's going to include their family. It may include their parents. It may likely going to include a large swath of friends, some who they really speak to a lot. Some they may just actually communicate with social media, but that's the audience you're trying to reach. And so it becomes important as you build your communications program and your brand program that you tie into those things and you recognize that, um, Yet negative things will happen, and the way that you respond to those negative things is just as important as the way that you actually um, respond to the positive things, because people respect that, and that's the way millennials get information. They get information from lots of different sources, and they look for what other people think about this before they make a decision of how they want to move forward. If you're a public company that's trying to expand your investment base and trying to get more people to invest, It's important to think about the ways people gather information about you and how they make decisions and making sure that you're in all those places in a way that strengthens your brand. It doesn't detract from it. But the message over social media has to be a little different from the message um, uh, over sort of traditional media. Uh, There are different expectations. I did a story about uh, the use of Twitter and millennials, uh, or just investors, I think they're young investors, were really turned off when companies would use Twitter and, and just kind of uh, kind of spout the party line a little bit and, and not be yep. responsive to, to you know, the dialogue that's going on there. They had to actually uh, be a little bit transparent. And, and that was the expectation over social media. Otherwise, they weren't welcome. You know, they, they weren't seen as part of the sort of social media world. Well, I think that, you know, that goes a little bit back to kind of the connect, contextual relevance of your content, right? So when you actually are using those channels, you, you don't just want to put an advertisement up there. You want to put relevant information that either informs someone or reinforces that you know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Because that starts to build that kind of brand awareness to say, huh, you know, I'm looking for information on X and I was on Twitter and I searched this particular subject and I saw this really interesting piece that was produced by this company. Let me get some more information about it, right? And it's not, it's not marketing. It's not, hey, open up an account today or invest in our company today. It's, hey, here's an interesting piece of information. Oh, you know what? That is interesting. Huh. I didn't yeah. know that. Maybe I should talk more to these folks. So kind of leading with thought leadership, I think in particular on social media becomes interesting. And I think that people also appreciate companies that – maybe can let their guard down a little bit on social media and, and use it in a little bit of a, you know, a tongue in cheek way sometimes where they can actually feel like you're actually conversing with what is a company and not an individual mm-hmm. uh, versus, you know, you know, I'm just, I'm talking to, you know, this big bank over here. You're not really talking to the big bank, but, you know, sometimes they can actually, you know, use social as a way of, you know, opening the doors a little bit and giving you a little bit more insight into what's going on and, you know, be a little bit more playful. And I think that becomes important. Yeah, they actually respect companies who who will show you a few of their flaws, at least on on the social media side. Transparent, right? You you want to be transparent. I'm thinking of Mayor Pete, Pete Buttigieg, who apparently is scoring points by saying things like, you know, 
uh, yeah, we really aren't up to speed on that, or, or, or we messed up, or, or <laughs> um, we're going to try harder. I... Hyper transparency. He's not like it, he's he's being transparent, and I think he, he he's a great example because he's a millennial, right? Yeah. And he understands these tools, and he's going out there and think about it, you know how quickly he's been able to get a very small base and grow it. It's because he's he's gen- maybe the right word is genuine, mm-hmm. right? They, people want people that are genuine in the way that they converse and the way that they talk, and it says, huh. Yeah. Okay. I've done that before. I've messed up before. I apologize for it. Let's move on. I like it. Okay. So, so one uh, um, aspect of their kind of investing personality is they, they respond to transparency and honesty and, and definitely do not uh, respond to, to kind of the routine sort of marketing initiatives. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I also think, you know, it's interesting from an investment space. If you look at the age of millennials, they're about to hit an age, I think, where things change. Mm. Um, and that is, you know, a lot of them are becoming parents. And a lot of them already probably are parents. And I think once that happens, I can speak for myself, and I'm not that far ahead of them, um, things change pretty dramatically, right? And at that point, you know, the fact that you may think you know everything as an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 25-year-old, you know, once you have children of your own, you're all of a sudden like, oh, my goodness, I need some assistance here to think about how am I protecting my kids and you know, what kind of insurance should I be buying and how am I going to pay for college? And so all of these new things start to present themselves. And I think we're, you know, interestingly enough, we're about to see this major transfer of wealth from one generation to the next. We're also seeing that next generation hitting an age where things start to become a lot more important um, just based upon where they are in their life. You know, one thing that, is said about this cohort, the millennial cohort, is they, they, they are bringing their values with them to invest. Definitely. Well, and I think one of the biggest differences that we've seen is that um, baby boomers and Gen X probably have a higher sense of loyalty to the companies that they actually, that's servicing them, the providers that they're using, hmm. um, maybe to even to a point of negativity where they probably are staying too long. I think one of the things we have noticed with millennials is millennials are willing to try out new things and they're willing to switch. And that that can be frightening, right? You know, you know, and so it, it goes back to that messaging. And it's funny, you brought up that kind of Mayor Pete example and being transparent and recognizing when you made a mistake. That's why that stuff is so important, right? Is to say, to be able to explain and kind of just be transparent about why decisions are made. So if you are a, a public company, an organization, and you do something that may not be perceived that well, it's important to have the right storyline to clean that up and explain why that happened because your investors are listening, Right. And then and I put it in the context of your audience, right? So if you're trying to reach out to millennials and you know that there's a very large segment of your population that invests in you because of sustainability or governance reasons or, and there's a problem in that area, make sure you speak to it. You can speak to other areas too, but you can speak to things that are going to show up in the social sphere, if you will, when it comes up to the social media, you know, it's going to show up in the right way, in the right message to the right audience. And there may be a different message and a different story that you give to another audience, and that's okay. And it's kind of one of the beauties of technology today is that it used to be really difficult to do that. Now we can segment the audience and we can put messaging out there so that depending on how someone actually finds the information, the story may be a little bit different because it's a telling a story that concerns that person that may not concern somebody else. So there's a lot of data out there uh, you can use to personalize communications, uh, which is especially useful when it comes to millennials uh, and you have to, to be there, where millennials are, with a brand that is, uh, you know, appealing to them. And part of that branding is transparency, honesty, um, personalization. Uh, I, well, I think it's, it's kind of right. There's the, there's the omnichannel nature that recognized, and, and the difference, I would say, between omnichannel and multichannel is that people think about, you know, multichannel, this channel or that channel. Omnichannel is all the channels, right? Realize all the different ways that people communicate with you and communicate on their terms, right? You want to, if someone wants to communicate and or converse and gain information by using social media, I should be there. If they want to do it this way, I should be there. I should be everywhere that potential audience members that I'm trying to attract are, right? That's kind of the omni-channel aspect. And they may use different channels and they may, and so the messaging should be consistent. Um, you know, that's kind of one piece. One is the messaging itself, right? How do you actually create messaging and personalize that messaging and make it, you know, I like the word contextual, right? It's contextually relevant to the person who's receiving it. It doesn't seem generic. It seems genuine, as we kind of hit on before. 
Um, and then I think it's reinforcing um, items and, you know, transparency, you know, as we've talked about a few times, I think becomes really important because honesty and information and feeling that trust is there by a generation who kind of started to hit and become adults right when the financial crisis was happening, mm-hmm. I think becomes an important piece. Yeah, because they're, they're risk adverse, uh, really, quite frankly, along with the rest of us. <laughs> Absolutely. I don't think they're all that different than you and I, right? I mean, I think that there's, there's a lot of, they're going through a lot of the same things that we went through. I think the difference is the tools that they have to do the investigation, hmm. right? And that's why, and I think that's, that's the big difference, right? Is that, you know, when we were younger, and I mean, I can speak, I, you know, I graduated college in 92. The internet came out several years later. And, you know, that all of a sudden became this new way to look for information. But before that, how did you get information? You know, you looked in the newspaper, you looked at the stock ticker each day. Um, It was a different way of collecting information and understanding what's going on now. The difference between then and now is that everything is real time, right? The information is available real time. People are going through the same decision making and the same questions that we all had. It's just that how they get the information is different. It's much more immediate and the ability to ask other people for assistance is greater than it's ever been, right? I could go online, you know, and I can ask, hey, you know, what are people's experience investing in company X? What do you think? Right? And I will have within the next two minutes, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people giving me their thoughts. And whether I trust those people or not, that's just the reality of where we are. So making sure that you're part of that conversation becomes really important. And that's a wrap for your Ticker Podcast this week. What did you think? You woke? You can stay part of this conversation by emailing us a voice memo to editor at irmagazine.com. Are you a mod or a rocker? Uh, no, I'm a mocker. <laughs> Thanks for listening. In Montreal, I'm Jeff Cossette.